So welcome to the Defiant Spirit. I'm Baruch Halevi, and I am honored and privileged you have tuned in either to this uh, podcast or this video. I'm doing both simultaneously. Um, and if you are watching on the video, you will notice if you've watched other um, videos that got a different backdrop, we are dealing with some fun filled problems in our basement around water and damage and all kinds of good stuff. So I've sacrificed my office for the cause. I got a teenager sleeping in there and if I waited for her to get up to do this podcast. Well, uh, I'd be waiting a very long time, which I actually have been. I finally gave up, put myself into um, Ariella's office and and dealing with the sounds and the uh, the the traffic and all kinds of things. So if it doesn't sound as good as it normally does, forgive me, but you can blame it on my teenager. That's what they're there for. So um, really, really excited to be getting back into the groove of some podcasting, taking a little break, though I pre-recorded some, so really haven't missed a, a week, but um, haven't done it in a few weeks because of the holiday of Passover and just all that was involved in getting ready for that. For those of you who celebrate a Passover, you know it's probably the most arduous, um, I don't know, there's just so much to, to do of all the Jewish holidays. You know, high holidays are infinitely more simple. You go to the synagogue and you pray and um, Passover. It's not a synagogue-based holiday. It's a home-based holiday, and it revolves around the the Exodus story. You can listen to my last podcast. And um, all kinds of food that you do eat, that you don't eat, cleaning and getting ready, and then the Passover Seder, the holiday meal, and inviting people over, and logistics, and then running the Seder. I mean, it is a production. However, I want to just begin there by saying, if you listen to my last podcast, you heard we did an Enneagram Seder. And what does that mean? Well, um, I didn't 100% know beforehand what it meant, although I had a pretty good idea. And it was wildly successful. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about why and how it relates to you, whether or not you um, have done the Passover Seder, or you're planning to do it, you don't need to, it has nothing to do with Passover or Easter, though, again, if you want to hear more about the connection, you can listen to my last podcast, Easter, Passover, and the Spring Equinox. Um, but it has to do with the, the essence of the Enneagram. So what is the Enneagram for those first timers who are just joining us and you haven't heard about it? Well, you've had about, I don't know, maybe 5,000 years to, um, to hear about the Enneagram because that's probably how long it's been around. It has changed and morphed during that time. And now lots of people think of it as an Enneagram, sorry, as a personality test. And it can be that, but that is like, um, you know, just such a thin piece of what it is. It's not a personality test. Myers-Briggs personality test, DISC is a personality test. They're great. They're, they're you know, they serve a purpose, but that's not what this is. I mean, Myers-Briggs has only been around since post-World War II, based on Jungian archetypes, but put together by um, a couple um, psychologists and, and whatnot. This is thousands of years old. And I don't just say that to be dramatic. I mean, it's built around sacred geometry. If you see in, on the picture, if you're watching, um, you can see the picture of my version of the Enneagram. I say my version only because it's the same Enneagram as anybody else uses. It's just my copyright and colors and, you know, format. But the bottom line is all Enneagrams are built around that triangle right in the middle. You see all those lines? Well, can see there's a equilateral triangle and it's built around that triangle. Well, that's the triangle of the pyramids. I mean, the pyramids are a, a case study in architecture and geometry. If you look at um, all kinds of ancient symbols, the Jewish star um, built on this triangle, uh, it just it's built into the fabric of creation. You can find the triangle in nature. You can find it in, and then you start getting into mathematics. The uh, equations like Fibonacci, uh, math and geometry are the oldest spiritual traditions and systems. We don't think of them as spiritual. We think of them as you know academic and and um, intellectual, and and they are, but they're so much more than that. So it really grows out of probably those traditions. And then different spiritual practices um, very much 
connected to the Desert Fathers of Christian Mysticism growing out of there, picked up by Kabbalah for sure, Kabbalah Jewish Mysticism, lots of um, crossover Sufi, um, Sufism, and I mean, again, it just goes on and on. So this is not new. This is not new age. This is not simply psychology 101. It's all of those things, but it's, it's so much more. And at the simplest level, if I had to boil it down, right, to what is the Enneagram? It is a roadmap to know thyself. Know thyself. You know, this. these are words. You might maybe have heard them before. Know thyself. Um, also ancient. They were inscribed at the Temple of Adelphi back in ancient Greece. And, you know, above this temple, as you entered into it, it said, know thyself. The equivalent, equivalent in Jewish um, tradition and mysticism is, and you'll see it oftentimes still reflected in synagogues, wherever you go, it, there's always an inscription above the Ark where the Ten, where the um, Ten Commandments originally were housed in the ancient temple, but now the Torah scroll. So if you if you go to a synagogue and you're invited to a bar about mitzvah, they'll take out the um, the Torah scrolls on which are inscribed the five books of Moses. But above the Ark where they're housed, oftentimes there's a, uh, a saying that says, Da lifne ata omed, know before whom you stand. Well, it's the same thing as know thyself, because know before whom you stand is certainly a reference to the Almighty, God, the One, the Source, but it's also a reference to yourself, to know before whom you stand, right? When you're looking in the mirror, I've talked about this a lot, who is it that's looking back at you, right? Who is the you in there? Is it the you staring back in the flesh suit, as Wayne Dyer says? Is it, you know, the, the you with hair or 10 years ago? Actually, for me, it was more like 15 years ago. Um, the, the version with hair. Now it's without hair. Is it the, the, the version that there's more of me because I have put on a little weight post-Passover? Or is it the version pre-Passover? Is it, um, you know, the five-year-old self or the 95-year-old self? And the answer is yes. Because although that is all versions of you and it's changing, that's not the true you. The true you can't change. It's a fact. It's a, it's an equation. It's mathematics, right? Two plus two, as I always say, doesn't equal four when I want it to. When I'm in a good mood, when I'm in a bad mood, when I was 10, when I will be 100, it's always four. It's a mathematical principle. Well, the same is true with you. There is a true you. That's the you we're talking about, capital U, capital S and self, true you, true self, spirit, soul, um, you know, Bob, John, Nancy, call whatever you want to call it that works for you. But there is a you, right, that is underneath there that was, is, and will always be. That's the you we're talking about, to know thyself, that self, the true self not the versions and variations that have become you or that you believe to be you, or that you present as you. And that's what the Enneagram does. It is a roadmap back to you, capital U, a true you. It is a roadmap of the false self. False is not bad. I will say it a thousand times. I say it to clients. I say it to people I'm talking to or teaching. False is not bad. You know, we, we say false self as in, oh, false as in fake. Well, not exactly. False self isn't, at least in mathematical terms, it isn't bad. It's just off, right? Two plus two equals five is close. You know, I can see how you got there if you're a little kid and you're counting and you count the same finger twice and oh, it's close. You're like, you're there, but you're not there. It's not true. It's not bad. It's no judgment. It's not wrong. It's a process to get to four. You got to go through your mathematical equations and, you know, the longer ones, longer version of that, and go through a lot of, you know, wrong permutations and combinations and answers until you get to the right one. And that's how we are built. We have false selves. And the Enneagram says there are basically nine false selves. Um, now, there's more than that. I'm not going to go into it all, but let's just say there are nine fundamental false selves, false masks, or in um, Greek, what is the word for mask? If you've been with me, you know this, persona. A persona is literally a mask. It's a mask that we wear 
to present ourselves to the outside world as a version of ourselves. And that isn't bad. That's necessary, right? Why do we wear a mask or have a persona? Because life is complicated. The moment you hit this world out of your mother's womb, it's a harsh reality, right? It is not an easy land for a baby. I've witnessed only four, but I've witnessed four being birthed by their mother, Ariella. And each and every time, it's traumatic. First of all, it's traumatic for me because I'm a big baby. Uh, I can't handle blood. You should know this. And uh, my family, you know, laughs at me because I present as an Enneagram 8, which is kind of the tough guy mask. And I'm a big coward. I'm the first to cringe when blood is on the scene. Um, I am the one hiding in the back when I used to officiate at... Um, is at circumcisions, I wouldn't go near it. I wouldn't touch it. I wouldn't. I'd be in the back cowering, drinking the wine so that I could get through the event. Um, yes, I'm a big baby when it comes to blood and bodily fluids and all that kind of stuff. So why do I say that? I don't remember. Oh, because I present the tough guy because the world's a scary place. It's a scary place to eights. It's a scary place to six. Um, the Enneagram type sixes live in a place of constant fear and rightly so you know as, as i say six is the ones who remind us that we're on a, a rock spinning around in outer space around a hot ball of fire that's going to eventually burn us up you know god willing it'll be like a billion years but still they're right so you know the world's a scary place and that baby came into the world those four babies that my wife birthed and they're screaming they're crying it's scary so from the very outset we have to start protecting ourselves getting our needs met putting on these masks you should not bear all to anybody um, just because you want to they need to earn the right to hold your vulnerability to to um, receive all of you right we reserve that for key people for loved ones you don't bear all to the starbucks barista she doesn't want it, and you shouldn't do it. Brene Brown talks a lot about this um, and vulnerability. Vulnerability isn't just bearing all. It's knowing who deserves us to be vulnerable, to bear our vulnerability. And there are different degrees. It's not all or nothing. The barista at Starbucks gets a little bit. Your spouse gets a lot and all kinds of gradations in between. So when you're not bearing all, when you're not saying, here I am, Lord, your world, take me, you know, as I am, um, which is very rare that you can just bear all, you put on a mask. In fact, um, it's very interesting, but Moses from the Bible has this epiphany, has this, this God moment, this divine experience up on the mountaintop. If you remember your, you know, Bible stories up there, how long is he up there? 40 days and 40 nights. It's, it's 40 is the number in Kabbalah of transformation. It's, 40 isn't just a number. Was he up there 40 days, 40 nights? I don't know. I wasn't there. But when you see 40 in the Bible, it's um, Kabbalah says it's the number of the womb. Um, and there's deeper reasons why. But it's um, it's a number symbolizing transformation. 40 days um, of rain with Noah. Whether 40 days now, it maybe. I don't know. Again, I can't say. It doesn't matter. Because it, it symbolizes a process of transformation. So Moses comes down after this transformation. He's beaming light. And it says that the people were overwhelmed. They couldn't handle Moses's light because that was pure intimacy. He says he saw the divine, panim el panim, face to face. And only the divine, only God could bear all of Moses. So what did he do? He put on a masecha, a mask. Hebrew word sounds very much like the Greek word because they're very similar. So on the masecha, the mask, he covers himself completely. No, he still radiates light, but not undiluted, unfiltered. That's the mask that you wear. So you have a mask that you put on. If you're a professional, you go to work. You know, when I was officiating as a rabbi and I did funerals, I had to wear a mask because if I felt like everybody else felt there and crumbled like everybody else rightly so crumbled, then they wouldn't be able to crumble. When I broke down a few times, you just, you know, you're human. Yeah, it's not, it shouldn't be a robot. But there was one um, funeral I did for a little girl named Mika this was 20 years ago. And it was just so, it's always tragic, but this one was particularly tragic. It seemed like a needless tragedy. 
And I just started bawling. I couldn't recover. And I lost control of the funeral. It wasn't bad. Nobody got hurt. But um, they it's not fair to them because they deserve this opportunity with their little girl, with their friend, with their loved one to be the ones that get to cry, to get to go there. And I have to hold the container, the space. So I wear a mask in those situations. One of the reasons why I'm not still officiating as a rabbi is because I started to become my mask. Um, like a lot of clergy do. This is a particular challenge with clergy. They start believing they are the mask. We all do this, regardless of whether we're clergy, we're doctors. I see it with doctors a lot. I see it with, um, you know, like judges. I see it with surgeon, which is a, obviously a doctor. Um, academics. We start, they start, we start believing we are the mask. We are the titles. We are the degrees. We are the roles. We are what people say about us for better and for worse. And when you do that, run for the hills. That is the beginning of the end. When you start believing you are the presentation, the persona, that is a pathway to hell. We need to wear the mask. We need to be able, however, to take the mask off. Um, it is so important. That's what, that's the role of a therapist or a spiritual director or a guide. That's the role I play in people's lives in this space, virtual space, you know, on zoom or on the phone or in person, you don't have to wear a mask. You don't have to filter it. If you are filtering it, you have a problem. I don't have a problem. You can filter all you want. I see through the bullshit, but when you believe you're bullshit, when you believe you're the mask, when you can't take it off, when you can't look in the mirror, when you can't tell yourself the truth, the truth about you, that as an Enneagram 8, I'm scared. I'm a scared little boy, right, who misses his dad, who who's con contemplating his mortality, who um, is responsible for four human beings in this lifetime, and I'm not equipped and capable. None of us are. We're all scared. If I present as an Enneagram 8 to the world, fine, need be. If I present as an Enneagram 8 to myself or to my wife or the handful of people that I have committed, my therapist committed to bearing all, to being honest, to being real, if Moses can't go up the mountain and reveal, take off the mask and reveal his true self to God, you're screwed because um, you have forgotten. You have forgotten the truth. Two plus two equals four. You've forgotten the truth about you that I am so much more than the mask. So the Enneagram comes along and says there are nine fundamental masks. They're not types, they're energies, they're patterns. We'll talk more about it later on. It's not random or coincidence that there are nine. Why aren't there 10 or why aren't there eight? Well, it's complex because triangles only have three points, not four points. And um, there are three basic energies in the universe, right? There's a positive charge. There's a negative charge. Charge. There's a neutral charge. There's three primary colors, blue, red, and yellow. Is that right? Did I just get them wrong? I think that's right. Um, there are three dimensions, right? I mean, the list goes on and on. So it's scientific and it's deep and complicated. But then off of those three, there are three more um, because there's a way to overexpress one of those points and underexpress it and then kind of synthesize it. So you have three on each corner. Three times three is nine. I'm not going to go down that path. That's a rabbit hole. It's super interesting. And we're going to talk about it but not today. Today, there are nine basic energies. Just trust me on that. And those basic nine energies or personas or masks or personalities or whatever you want to call them are, we all have a core mask, a core type. It doesn't mean you don't wear all of them. And part of the work I do is to help you try on other false selves. Which sounds really messed up. Um, I want you to have access to other masks because I want you to, I want to be able to, right, play, you know, it's, it's playing different parts at different times in different situations. I want access to them all. We're lazy. Human beings are lazy. We're all lazy. We all end up creating rituals, um, defaults, patterns, ruts, routines. We don't even realize it. 
like first you put on the toothpaste cap, then you take it off, then you, you know, brush your teeth this way, and then you rinse, and then you floss. Oh, but I'm free. I have free will. Really? Pay attention to the, your routines and notice what happens when your routines get messed up. So we all have these personalities as a routine, as a go-to, as a default. First, we need to have access to all of them. And then we need to have the ability to transcend ours and all of them. You are not your mask, but you need your mask. Again, from the time you come out of the womb until the time you die. The question is, which mask are you wearing? When are you wearing it? Why are you wearing it? Are you choosing to wear it or are you, is it choosing you? Right? Does Do you have a number or does your number have you? That's the work of the Enneagram. So know thyself. Know which type you're going to end up as. As I mentioned before, we had the Passover Enneagram Seder. It was outstanding. We did a traditional-ish Seder, um, Passover meal, which is really telling the story of the Exodus and then ritualized around different, um, well, rituals. And but it revolves around telling the story of the Exodus. And again, the story of the Exodus, if you want to listen more, listen to the last podcast, is all about the journey from slavery to freedom. It's the story of the Israelites being redeemed by Moses. Um, it's not about a historical narrative. It's about a personal narrative because we're supposed to see ourselves as if we're in the story. It's not enough to read a history book at the Passover Seder. As I mentioned, I think in the last podcast, history, his story, their story, not my story. In Hebrew, there's no word for history. There's only memory. Yeah, that was last podcast. So now it's all coming back to me. I'm not going to repeat it, but memory is, is mine, right? And that's the difference between reading a history book and having memories of your loved ones. That's not history. My, my dead father is not history to me. It's memories. And I guard those memories. I guard that story. My friend Nancy, who's listening to this, I know, is all about guarding the story and telling the story. And I'm going to have her on here one day. You know who you are um, to, to talk about how to do that. But the bottom line is you're supposed to, at the Passover Seder, tell your story. Well, you can't tell your story by reading a history book. You have to tell your story about your personal slavery. Well, B, you know, like I live in America in the 21st century. How do I know about slavery? Well, thank God you don't have shackles on your legs if you live in America, but there are all kinds of shackles that we wear, all kinds of ways that we are enslaved by money, by sexuality, by appetites, by desires, by limiting beliefs and um, shame. I mean, the list goes on. There's no shortage of shackles that we all wear. So we have to get unshackled. We have to take off our masks and realize how we're trapped in our mask. Well, that's what we did at the Passover Seder. Um, all of the participants got their Enneagram number ahead of time. Either they knew it or they took a test. And I did a little summary of it. And then we went around the table and we talked about our Enneagram preferred core type, our go-to, our mask, and how we have a number, but also how our number has us. And it was amazing from the youngest who was 11, my son Aviv, to the oldest, which I'm not going to say was my wife, but was my wife. Um, she's only six weeks older than me. So we're pretty darn close. So from the youngest to the oldest, and we had lots and lots of teenagers and 20 somethings. Cause my sis, my, my daughter invited friends and my son who's in college invited friends and it was riveting. Would they be that interested in talking about the Israelite slavery? Zippo, zero, nada. Were they interested in talking about their own slavery? Unbelievable. They were engrossed. I had to finally cut it off because I was afraid we were never going to eat and the little one was getting a little pissed. So, I mean, he was into it a little bit, but um, not as much as they were. As, as an aside, <laughs> just to show you how, you know, it, it can um, adapt to whoever is, is utilizing it. It morphed quickly for the boys who were 20 years old in a fraternity to... How does this relate to dating, right? So I'm going to do an Enneagram in dating because, man, were they interested in um, how do you best utilize this, let's just say it in a nice way, to find the 
person of their dreams. Um, and it was a little more crass than that. But what was amazing was they started to see, well, the Enneagram 1 defaults to perfectionism. The Enneagram 7 defaults to freedom and liberation. So the one had a lot of to say about himself around how he becomes a perfectionist and becomes trapped and enslaved and beats himself up. The seven it was interesting. I've noticed this with seven. So seven is the enthusiast, the enthusiastic visionary. The sevens are the ones who tend to say, I don't want to do the Enneagram because nobody will limit me or define me. Well, it was interesting. He had that reaction and we started talking about but isn't that slavery or servitude to say that I'm so free that nothing can touch me? There's a sense of slavery in that. And that's what happens with the seven. They start running from things that limit them as an act of, they believe, freedom. I would say it's reaction. It's, it's servitude. If you can't stand still, which is what sevens are loath to do, to face the things that challenge you that limits you, that make you deal with the moment, with um, what, everything that that brings up, which for seven is usually around pain and suffering, then in many ways you're using your freedom as a, as a mask. And it was amazing to watch this young man realize that, stand still, own his sevenness as a pathway to freedom. The Enneagram nine at the table, the peacemaker was talking about how he um, has always prided himself on being easygoing. He's the glue in this particular group. And they were all saying he's the glue. Well, as he was talking, he realized he packs his needs and puts them away on the shelf because they get in the way. They cause conflict around others. And he tells himself, I am here to be the glue. Yes. And there is a loss of freedom in that. And what he worked on that evening was um, expressing his own needs to the others at the group and taking back some of those needs, taking off his nine mask. And the list goes on. I mean, so we went around the table and we had almost, we had a five, we had four, we had two, we had seven, we had six, we had a bunch of eights. Um, we had a nine, we had a one. I, you know, I think the only one we didn't have represented was a three, but it was remarkable to hear that and even within the types, there are subtypes. So even the eights didn't look alike. I'm a sexual eight. Uh, my daughter is a social eight. And I think you know, we were the two eights. So you can, we have very different experiences of eightness. And everybody has a different persona. Everybody had a different mask. Everybody had a different pathway where they lose themselves into their number. And everybody had stories to talk about how they've lost themselves, but also how that mask has given them the ability and strength to make a stand in their life. This is the language of Viktor Frankl, to make a defiant stand. So it isn't bad. Sometimes those masks, we can lose ourselves. But sometimes they can be our pathway to freedom. My daughter, who's a social aide, talked about how she just can breathe when she has a cause, when justice is called into question. That's when she's at her best whether it's an individual or whether it's a group, whether it's a, you know, it doesn't matter the cause, but it's oxygen to an eight or the, um, the four, right? The four is all about feelings. And when they can help other people access their feelings, find their feelings, they make the best therapists like Ariella. Um, they are, they can breathe. They feel like they're living their sole purpose. So you know, the, the high side of these numbers is liberating. The low side of these numbers is incarcerating. And our work, whether it's Passover or whether it's day to day, is to look in the mirror and to know thyself and to know the mask and to understand it. There's nothing worse in my experience in this lifetime than to die not having done this work. I say that not having died. I say that having sat with people who are dying. And in the process of dying, I've had the privilege, and it is one of the greatest privileges I've ever known, to sit at the bedside of the dying. Um, I've had multiple experiences ranging from a man I sat with just prior to my dad's death, or maybe it was just after, this was 16 years ago, who knew himself. And I was just in awe of, he was, he lived this world 
you know, with the defiant spirit. I don't recall if we, he knew the Enneagram, but he didn't need to. He lived it. And he really described, you know, his journey, his failures, his, his successes. He left this world on his terms, blessing the people around him. Um, and it was just remarkable. It was awe-inspiring to see a person who knew themselves. And then not that long ago, maybe it was, it was during COVID. So maybe it was a year or two ago, I sat with a, another man at his bedside. I was called in um, by hospice here locally in Denver and they, they didn't have a chaplain on staff. So they called me in and I sat with this person and he was, I'm guessing an Enneagram six. Enneagram six is, um, the loyalist, but sometimes they're loyal to the wrong things, the wrong causes, um, their fear. You know, they can be loyal to their fear and not even know it. And he had lived his life, as he described it, um, dominated by his anxiety and his fear. And he died with so much regret because towards the end, he became fearless or less fearful. He had an awakening. I've seen this a lot, you know, towards the end. But in the final months or weeks of his life, he finally realized there was really nothing to be afraid of except this. But all the other things paled in comparison. And it was just a conversation. I held a kind of confessional. And he spilled his heart and soul around how he wasted so much of his life not knowing that he was living in fear, that he was subservient to his fear. And now he knew it. And yeah, on the one hand, it was beautiful because he had a deathbed awakening. On the other hand, it was tragic to listen to a man talk about wasted opportunity, wasted time, subservient to that low side of the six to be enslaved by his fears. And so we can live this life knowing ourselves and dying with clarity and certainty and conviction, having lived that type of life, or we can die like this other man having lived a life of being enslaved to the mask, believing that's who we are, nothing wrong with wearing the mask. It's when we believe it's who we are and we give ourselves over to it, that can be and is, in my experience and opinion, the greatest tragedy. So the work of the Enneagram gives us a mirror to see ourselves, to learn about who we are, to know thyself. If you want to continue down this path with me, jump over to the defiantspirit.org. Hopefully by the time you're watching this, I will have launched Defy Your Number, but if not, certainly we'll be close. Um, it's a program that I've created to walk you through the basics of what you need to know to discover your Enneagram number, the mask that you default to, and defy your number to be able to take that mask off and put on other masks, and then take those masks off and live beyond the mask. That's the work that we're all here to do, right? Viktor Frankl says, life asks you the meaning of life by questioning you. You don't ask life. It's not what you expect from life. It's what life expects from you. And what life expects from you, in my experience, is to, above all else, know thyself, know yourself, Socrates said the unexamined life is not worth living. I would echo that sentiment. I would say don't check out. I would say just don't live it. Learn who you are and what you are and why you are here. Learn how you react and learn most of all how to stop reacting and start responding. Know thyself. The Enneagram is the single most powerful and practical pathway I have ever known to know thyself and to live thyself, to stop reacting as a small s self and to start responding as a capital S self. That's what this is all about. So until we meet again, get out there and defy your number and live your spirit because that's the work that you're here to do. Take care.